Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such a way hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a prayer from the book of Common Prayer, and we're going to turn and look at Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon from verse 14 to verse 36. It's the first sermon ever preached in the Christian church, uh, which makes it of more than interest. But I want to begin by the question of the week, if we can put up. So I put this on the sign outside. Now, the signs, we're, we're getting the sign sorted. It's very uh, kind of confused and dull, but... Um, why bother listening to preaching? And the sign I had said, uh, come and hear God speak. And I, I put it on social media, and immediately, of course, you can imagine the kind of response. Does he speak with a Scottish accent? If so, I'm, if so, I'm not coming. You know, and you, uh, people, are you saying you're God? No, I'm not. But what we're saying is, when God's word is preached, it's not the preacher that matters. It is how God speaks to us. And so the question of the week is really why bother with preaching? Now, we're looking at a book called Acts, and there are plenty of people who say, I don't want to hear your preaching. I want to see what you do. I want your acts. But in the book of Acts, the actions go together with the word because God is a speaking God. We would not know him or what he has done if he did not reveal himself to us. Well, how does he do so? He does so through his creation. The first part of Psalm 19 says that. He does through, through providence, our circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, let's say that you, um, you could hardly string two words together and your voice wasn't particularly strong. It's very unlikely that God has called you to be a preacher. Um, he's certainly not called me to be a singer. You know? So providence is you look at your circumstances and then he does through, through giving his word. Prophecy is basically God speaking. And when God speaks, he brings life. That's how creation was done. God spoke and it came into being. When God speaks today, he brings new life. That's how you become a new creation and we get new spiritual life. Through speaking, God works. The word of God goes into our inmost being. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It reveals and acts and saves and brings light. It's dynamite. It heals. It renews. It restores. And for that reason, it's more certain than dreams, feelings, religions, and philosophies. So why bother with preaching? Because if you're not a Christian, you need to become a believer. And how can you hear without a preacher? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as Christians, we need to be built up in our faith and challenged. So it's interesting, isn't it? I think a lot of people, the preaching is the bit of the service they endure. Uh, and for other people, the singing is the bit of the service that they endure. And for other people, the prayers, you know. And, and, and it's a shame because if we grasp that it really is God who is speaking to us, it would make a phenomenal difference. Let me just say something about uh, as in preaching in the book of Acts, there are four words that are used for preaching. Maybe my, my second question would be what makes a good sermon. One word that's used for preaching means a herald's announcement. So like we have notices when Terry was standing up and speaking, it's like he'd go outside with a megaphone and shout at people and, and you know, hear ye, hear ye. The second word that's used means teaching. The third word is exhortation, it's pleading. And the fourth word, the only way to put it is like homily. So that's looking at life in the light of the Christian message. So with that in mind, we turn to this passage. Uh, you could argue that this is the greatest sermon ever preached, uh, Peter's sermon, because of its power, because of its result. And it's certainly, whatever it is, it is a model of what preaching should be. It was simple and clear. It was memorable. So there's a test. If I phone you up tomorrow and say, what did I preach about yesterday? That's going to be interesting. Uh, maybe I should start doing that. 
and we'll find out. Maybe it'll make you listen more attentively. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. There's a preacher called Alistair Begg, and uh, I listen, we listen to him quite a bit, but I remember when I was 16 years old when he was a Baptist preacher. He's now in America. He was a Baptist preacher in uh, Scotland, and I remember him distinctly preaching a sermon on Colossians called Bombing the Landing Strip, and I can remember what was said during the sermon. Now, I have to say that is extremely rare. I don't even remember my own sermons. Uh, if you ask me, what did you preach on yesterday, uh, tomorrow, uh, maybe I wouldn't be able to. Uh, well, I think I would be able to tell you, but it, it's, you know, it, there's something about this that's very dynamic. Now, another aspect of this is that in, in terms of our c culture and our context, it, it just doesn't sound the most riveting invitation in the world, come and hear a sermon. You know, it just really doesn't. And yet, there was a survey done of, 10, of the 10 largest growing churches in Edinburgh. And they varied from Presbyterian to Charismatic, Baptist, and so on. And the number one reason for their growth was the teaching. We tend to think other things, but it's the teaching. So, let's go through this sermon and let's see four characteristics. Forgive me, I like my alliteration. They all begin with the letter B. Um, it may be a bit strained, but let's start with chapter 2, verse 14. And, and we're coming into a situation where there had been this wind, the tongues of fire, and then these disciples had started speaking in the languages of the Jews who'd gathered for Pentecost from all over the, the known world at that time. And uh, they were amazed and confused that they heard these disciples speaking in their own language. And they asked, what does it mean? And some mocked and said they've had too much wine. And this is Peter's answer. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, one of the most extraordinary things about this is Peter's transformation from a coward who couldn't even answer a serving girl to a man who stands up in front of possibly 100,000 people and boldly preaches. This is the first of 15 sermons in Acts. Uh, there are seven by Peter, five by Paul, and one each by Stephen and James. The sermon itself, uh, as we've got it in front of us, it only takes five minutes to read. And some of you instantly are going, wow, five minute sermons, wouldn't that be great? Uh, it's not gonna happen. And the reason it's not gonna happen is you have gotta read the whole passage. Because in verse 40 it says, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. It's certain that what we've got here is a summary of what he said. Uh, Luke researched, remember Luke researches all this. He would have gathered witnesses and, and heard what had been said. You know, I, I think of that in terms of the length of sermons. I've, I've been in an hour-long sermon which felt like 15 minutes or five minutes, to be honest, and I've been in a, a, a five-minute sermon that felt like an hour or an eternity. Uh, it, it, it's not the length that really matters. I've been in churches where I was told, uh, they, they give you a schedule uh, or a schedule or whatever, and, and they say, you start preaching at 10.02 and you finish at 10.21. And that's the detail. I just, I find that just incredible in terms of in the book of Acts. This is God speaking to us. We don't say to him, right, you're on a timer. Um, which is not to argue for lengthy sermons, but it is to say we should be prepared and, and eager and, and happy to hear. Sometimes in the Presbyterian church we might um, despise or speak not despise, but speak a bit disparagingly of Pentecostals and various things. But I remember a, a, an African uh, Pentecostal guy who came and he said to me that in his church they sang for an hour and a half and they preached for an hour and a half, if not two hours. And if a preacher didn't preach for 90 minutes, the people felt shortchanged. 
So when you get 30 minutes here, or sometimes 35, even stray over into that, just be thankful for small mercies. So what does he do? He gets their attention. I mean, it's a bit ironic. Look, he says, uh, they're not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. That's the beginning of his sermon. He's saying, listen carefully to what I've got to say. Let me explain this to you. These people are not drunk. And then he kind of makes a joke. He says, it's only nine in the morning. Who gets drunk at nine in the morning? Well, some people do, but obviously it's, it, it, it's a, a comment that he's making about how ridiculous the accusation is. The third hour it was. The Jewish day ran from 6 o'clock to 6 p.m., so the third hour was 9 a.m. Now, what he does is, in this sermon, he deals with the immediate circumstances, what is happening, an issue that has arisen, and he and has caused lots of questions. They're puzzled, they're perplexed, and he answers. It's one of the big problems that people like me have, preachers have, is that sometimes you're standing up and you don't know what are people thinking and are people a asking questions. And so part of what we do is try and stimulate people to ask questions. I think you would know that we were in renewal and revival if people couldn't keep quiet and indeed even shouted out during the sermon, which is very un-Presbyterian, but uh, it's happened lots. There was something going on. There was a power in the church that people wanted to find out about. And you find that in the whole book of Acts, that the preaching of the word and the power of the spirit going together being filled with the Spirit and being filled with the Word are connected. I think of one woman who, who said, as I listened, it seemed as though my heart was on fire. And that is what we desperately long for. I do think that in general terms, it's incredibly boring to sit and listen to someone give a monologue. I mean, they could be really entertaining and stuff and it still wouldn't really hit home. But in general, it's, it would be pretty boring. But it's never boring when God is speaking to you through his word. It's challenging many times, but it's never boring. So then let's go on to verse 16, and, and the preaching is biblical. Peter immediately goes from the question to an answer from Scripture. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." So what Peter does is, something is happening, you're wondering what's going on. Let me take you to the Bible. Let me take you to the scriptures you know. He, he uses uh, Psalm 69, I think it is. He uses Psalm 110 and this passage from the prophecy of Joel. As a general rule, I would suggest this. If you want to know what's going on in the world, then sure, read the news, Google things. But if you want to know why it's happening, go to God's word. Because God's word explains what is happening in our current context, which is why, amongst other things, preaching must always be uh, contemporary. It must be bold, it must be biblical, but it's the Bible applied to contemporary society. The Bible itself is 66 books, as most of you know, but it's one book with one message and one author, the Spirit, and the story is the story of redemption, the story of salvation, told on every page. To be biblical, preaching is the proclamation of God's Word in the power of the Spirit, applying it to the present, and preparing us for the future. And you'll notice in verse 17, the revolutionary aspect of this. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, even on my servants, both men and women. So it was for everyone. It was for all people. It was for men and women. 
it wasn't the outpouring of the Spirit as happened in the Old Testament, the anointing of the priest, or the, the special outpouring on, for example, Saul or other prophets. From the day of Pentecost, all God's people, as we saw last week, receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean we're all preachers, but it does mean that we all have God's Word, and we can all share God's Word in different ways. Now, not all of Joel happened on the day of Pentecost. Look at verse 20. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. That didn't happen on that day. So what's he talking about? He's probably talking about 49, 50 days earlier when the sky did go dark. And he's probably talking about also at that time there was a reference to the moon turning to blood because of the color of it. So I think he's talking about that, but I think he's also saying we are now in the last days, and from now on until Jesus returns, these signs will be fulfilled. Again, just to illustrate, if you're talking about our culture, what did Jesus say? He said there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famine and plague and earthquakes. Well, what's happening in our world today is what Christ told us would happen. It doesn't mean he's going to immediately return tomorrow. or to, We don't know when Christ is going to return, but this all fits in, and Peter explains that. Salvation is for everyone as well. Look at verse 21. Everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. See, that's a really important thing. Anyone who comes in here, I can honestly say to you, if you call on Christ, you will be saved. Now, some of you will lack assurance. I'm reading a book just now on assurance, which is a huge book. And I hadn't realized that assurance was so important and so difficult in many ways. I wrote in the pastoral letter this week about um, having doubts. And some of you feel that having doubts is something you can't express or something that's a betrayal of God. But it's way more common than most people realize. And assurance can be really difficult, but you need to be assured of this. I, I, read, this, I read only this morning that you, you cannot allow the truth to be determined by how you are feeling at any particular point. Everyone who calls to the name of the Lord will be saved. And you say, well, Lord, am I saved? I've called on you. Well, yes, you, you are or you will be because God can't lie. It's a hugely important thing. Salvation is for everyone. Ironically, people complain about the church being exclusive when in reality we are the most inclusive organization in the world because we say everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's another aspect of this. Um, we're all, Peter was not speaking from notes. Right? Some people are incredibly gifted and they can, they can, they've got a great memory and they can speak. Um, some people write out word for word what their sermons are. What I personally do is just I write down notes and then speak from them, which is why I can never tell you when I'm going to finish. But the, the, he had no preparation. He didn't know this was going to happen. So how could he speak like this? You'd say the Spirit enabled him, yes. But Peter was saturated in the Scripture. And the Scripture comes back to your mind. So this week we got stuck in a wee bit of traffic, uh, Broadmeadow, uh, because Pink was here. And if you don't know who Pink is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for you. Uh, but she's actually okay. She's actually quite good. Um, I didn't go and see the show. You could tell it was Pink because of all the people dressed in Pink uh, as they went to it. And from our house, uh, from our, our bathroom, I could hear uh, her singing and the crowd singing along with her. Well, that's nothing compared with Taylor Swift, who is just in all the papers and loads of people are speaking about. She's been at the MCG for two nights. I think she's there tonight. 96,000 people. And the most amazing thing about seeing any of it is how all predominantly young females know every single word from all 11 of her albums. You know, I, I saw a video of a 10-year-old girl just hysterical, but knowing every single word. You know that experience, not of Taylor Swift, but you know the experience of hearing a song that you've not heard for decades, and the words come out because you've got it in your head. You've got them in your heart, to be honest. 
I do think there's an enormous danger of teaching our young people idolatry in that way. Um, uh, Taylor Swift, the thing just amazes me that serious newspapers like the Sydney Morning Herald and even the Australian were saying things like Taylor Swift can save the planet or Taylor Swift is going to rekindle the Australian economy, there's Taylor, Taylor economics or something. You know, and people making serious comments on this, Taylor Swift will stop Donald uh, Trump being re-elected and all that kind of stuff in Katara for the Katara um, SRE classes and the people who are doing that. And I think uh, New South Wales has this wonderful thing of teaching scripture to young people and do please pray for that. But here's Peter. He's saturated with scripture and when he's called upon, he is able to bring it to mind with the help of the Holy Spirit. So it's biblical. Third thing, verses 22 to 28, it's big picture. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by one, miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's just a, such a brilliant line. Uh, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, here's what this extraordinary fisherman does. He takes scripture he takes history, he takes God's plan, and he puts it all together, and he explains it. Uh, Acts 2.23, uh, a crooked generation, or it says there, you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You see what Peter does? He manages to marry God's sovereignty and human responsibility. He was handed over to you by God's deliberate purpose, but you killed him. You're responsible. You can't turn around and say, oh, no, no, God did that. No, no, he, he, he balances the two things wonderfully. And I love the boldness. We often talk about sin in general, or sadly in churches, we talk about other sins, those people, how they dress, how they behave. But we don't like to be direct to the people who are here to upset people, to cause discomfort. Sometimes we're too quick to offer false comfort. Sometimes we'll say something like we confess our sin, general confession of sin, don't worry, everything's okay. But actually everything may not be okay. And you may hear something that breaks and, and wounds and hurts and you can't just put a sticking plaster over it. You have to go and deal with what God does. And, and, and Peter looks at these people and he says to him, you murdered. You murdered the Holy One. You murdered the Perfect One. You did it, not somebody else. It's extraordinarily brave what he said. And yet, he also offers them, as because of the big picture, the salvation. So, for example, in the cross, it was the most evil day, and yet it was a day God planned. He was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. It wasn't an accident. The, to the crowd listening to this, those who were devout Jews, and almost certainly all of them would have been, they are they're going, hang on a minute. This man was hung up on a tree. That's the curse of God. How, how can you possibly worship a human being Never mind one who was hung on a tree. The cross meant that Jesus could not be the Messiah. Something extraordinary would have to happen to get them to come and to uh, see that. And can I say this? I think there is a tendency increasingly in churches to avoid the cross except as a symbol. And not the awful reality of it. 
And then another big picture thing. So Peter sees the whole world through the eyes of the cross. He sees the whole world through the eyes of the resurrection. Verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Jesus is alive and it was impossible. It's impossible for us to get out of death. You can't get out of it. But it, it's, it was impossible for death to keep hold of Jesus, such as his greatness. And then the ascension and the risen Christ. Notice in the psalm that's quoted, Psalm 16, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Psalm 22, it talks about Jesus enduring what went before him because of the joy of knowing the fruit that would come. Hebrews uh, expounds upon that. And that's what we do when we proclaim the gospel. We say, look, it's really personal. It's for you, every single individual one here. It's directly and personally for you, from the youngest to the oldest. But we say it's for here, it's for us in, the, in, in, in Scots and uh, other churches, Charleston and so on. We say it's for Hamilton. We say it's for Newcastle. We say it's for New South Wales and Australia and Indonesia and to the end of the earth. The gospel is so big picture that it encompasses everything that has gone on in the past, everything that is going on in the present, and everything that will go on in the future. Nothing escapes its gaze. And that's because of this. So the fourth thing and the final thing is verses 29 to 36, where we say it's about the bridegroom, or it's bridal if you want to put it that way. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now, as we go through the book of Acts, we'll discover that Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament. And notice the, the, the logic of Peter. You can go to David's grave. We know where it is. We know where his tomb is. You can go to Christ's grave, but he's not there. This is what this song is, is teaching about. Christ's life, accredited by miracles and signs and wonders. Christ's death, the cross. Christ's resurrection. Someone uh, had the, a title of a sermon on 224, You Can't Keep a Good Man Down. It's a bit flippant, but it, I think it gets the point. Someone else has suggested that the book of Acts should be called the Acts of the Resurrection. So often is the resurrection mentioned. He pours out the Holy Spirit, verse 33. He's seated on the throne. We looked at that in terms of the ascension. But then this extraordinary phrase, this Jesus, the one on the cross, the man on the cross, whom you killed, he is Lord, and he uses the word for Lord that was used, the, the name that the Jews, for the Jews was so sacred, Jehovah or Yahweh, he uses that, the Greek translation of it, to say, Jesus is God. He's the Messiah. He is God. He is kurios Yahweh, is, is how it's put. Well, that is extraordinary. And that's what we do when we preach. We are preaching Christ. It's amazing how many times you can go into a church service and you'll hear a sermon on ethics or you'll hear a story from the Bible and it never gets around to Jesus. And that's just wrong. It, by the way, it's just as wrong to kind of throw Jesus into everything you know it just doesn't in in the sense of just mentioning the name of Jesus we've got to understand how in, in the way that Peter did how all this clicks together so that Christ is the explanation of the scriptures but he's also the explanation of our culture and our lives and where we're at so uh, let me give you an example of that. You'll have been aware some of you I think if you watch the news of the Russian opposition leader Alex Nalvani dying. Now, we don't know whether he was killed by the Russian state. He probably was. Certainly being in prison uh, would, did not help his health. But maybe what many don't know is he was a professing Christian. He wasn't always. This is what he said. 
The fact is that I am a Christian. I was once quite a militant atheist myself, but now I am a believer, and that helps me a lot in my activities because everything becomes much, much easier. I think about things less. There are fewer dilemmas in my life because there is a book in which, in general, it is more or less clearly written what action to take in every situation. It's not always easy to follow this book, of course, but I'm actually trying. And so, as I said, it's easier for me, probably, than for many others to engage in politics. No, I think that statement is inadequate and lacking uh, in the sense of the lack of focus on Christ and also... I think the translation from the Russians, when he says, I think about things less, I don't think he means that in particular. I think he's saying, I don't worry about things so much. I don't try and work everything out. And I think that uh, that's why he was saying, you know, I can engage in this. And it's why he was prepared to give up his life, because he was, because he was in exile and he decided to go back. And there's an extraordinary documentary about him which says, I'm probably going to be killed. And he knew that. His wife was left in Europe, and he went back. Well, it's because he believed in the book, but he believed in the Christ of the book. And that's what preaching is, full of Christ, full of the Spirit, full of Scripture, God speaking. So I leave you with this. We're going to look at the response of the crowd next week, uh, because I don't want to take too much of your patience, try your patience too much. But I just simply ask what your response is. Know what other people's responses are. Just simply what your response is. You can't respond for other people. Sometimes you're sitting in church and you're thinking, I hope that so-and-so is listening to this. Well, forget them. It's not your responsibility to listen for them. Sometimes you may even think, oh, I wish that so-and-so was here to hear this. Well, that's fine. Invite them. Bring them. But Jesus, and this is something that's always amazed me, very often he would say when he was going to say something important, if you've got ears, listen. Oh, we've all got ears. What was he meaning? Well, how do we listen to preaching? With humility, questions, prayerfully, seeking to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, Seeking that when we go from this place, that it's not, oh, well, that was nice. Bye. Now let me get on with life. It should have some impact. So I wonder if we could say this. There were 3,000 people who were converted um, that day. 3,000. I think they heard. They really heard in a biblical sense of the word what Peter was preaching. I think there were 97,000 who heard but didn't hear. Or maybe they heard, maybe Paul was there, Saul was there, and he heard but didn't hear. And later on, it, it impacted in their lives. We don't know. But I think it's a dreadful thing that on the day of judgment, you could stand before God and say, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't know this. If only I'd known And I think God will say, but I told you, and you didn't listen. Those who have ears to hear, let them listen. And what a privilege it is. I say for me, it's an absolute privilege to teach God's word. It's not because I like the sound of my own voice, and it's not because I think I can actually do anything. I don't think I can. But it's a sheer privilege to teach God's word. And I think we need to have the attitude in listening to it which says for us it's such a privilege we want others to share in that. Come, come and hear, come and see. Find out for yourself. Maybe people will be amazed and perplexed, so much so that they will come and want to know more. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for the great encouragement of it. Pray your blessing upon it and pray that we would apply it to our own lives. May I and every person here not just be the people who, who listen and speak, but may we really listen, may we take it to heart, and may we apply it to our own lives. May your spirit work in our lives and the lives of all around us, for we ask it in your name. Amen. I try.